You know what? It's not even in my set. Maybe I never set it. Yeah, I That's yeah. So yeah. yeah, you feel bad. I don't think I said it. I'll send it to you when I get home. All right, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you for being here. If you need more donuts or coffee, just go on over there and get more donuts and coffee. Today, we are honored to have Reverend Dr. Ann Stewart here today. She's the Executive Vice President of Princeton Theological Seminary and a wonderful human being, and so we're very grateful to have her here um, to talk about the sort of seminary experience and whatever else you want to talk about today. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Well, um, it is terrific to be, uh, to be with you. Uh, always good to be here and grateful for this uh, invitation to talk about uh, voices of faith. Uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the perspective of theological education, uh, but I thought I might begin with a little bit about my own story uh, and then uh, invite you to share a little bit about your own story uh, with theological education and of learning the faith. And this is a deeply um, important question to Presbyterians. We were talking earlier this morning about Presbyterians tend to sit in the back uh, and <laughs> the person chosen, but what is also characteristic of Presbyterians um, is a value uh, in a thinking faith, in faith seeking understanding. And so theological education has always been vital to all the people of God and especially to Presbyterians and, uh, and the Reformed tradition. Uh, and that's certainly been true in my own story. So I want to invite you to think a little bit today about um, who is it that taught you the faith? How did you learn the faith? Uh, and for me, I've learned the faith in many different ways. Uh, I first learned the faith uh, from my parents. My mother is actually zooming in uh, right here, so uh, she's, she's overhearing this conversation. Uh, but I, I brought two artifacts from my youth today just to prove that my parents taught me the faith. One uh, is the, the children's Bible, which I can remember my father reading to me uh, every night before I went to bed. Uh, he took me to Sunday school every week, and that was part of how I learned the faith. Um, I also have this second book here. Maybe you've seen uh, a version of this, Life's Little Instruction Book. Have you ever seen this? Uh, so my mother gave this to me um, years ago, and um, part of so it has sort of all kinds of advice uh, in it. And, um, and what she did was she went through and she circled various things she thought were important. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, just so open a page here. One of the things is uh, don't postpone joy. That was circled. Uh, there's a check mark next to write thank you notes promptly. <laughs> um, now there's here on this page is circled and starred never encourage anyone to become a lawyer. <laughs> Copy of everything that she starred in the circle. <laughs> 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 uh, but part of this is it's also part of how uh, the faith is passed on, the wisdom tradition is passed on, that it's annotated, right? So mm -hmm. when we pass on faith uh, from one person to another, uh, we mark the things that we think are important, right? And that is true in the biblical tradition as well. So I learned about the faith from my parents. I learned about the faith uh, from my church, from church communities. I was very fortunate to grow up in the Camp Hill Presbyterian Church in central Pennsylvania, which was a community of faith that uh, formed and shaped me over many years. It was a community of faith that um, called forth uh, in me gifts of leadership. There were many people in that congregation who said to me uh, over the years, um, you know, you have gifts for ministry. Have you thought about seminary? Uh, and so they are a very important part of my faith story. And I've been so uh, privileged to be part of many poignant uh, church communities uh, through the years. When I was in seminary, uh, in the summertime, I worked at two um, very small parishes in uh, central Maine uh, with a, a housing ministry called Mission at the Eastward. Uh, and those communities there also formed and shaped me in the faith. 
uh, during seminary, I worked at Old Pine Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, and that community of people uh, also were a vital part in helping me to develop gifts for leadership and ministry and shaping my faith. Uh, and when I was uh, ordained as a Presbyterian minister, uh, people from that congregation were there to bear witness uh, to that uh, and were part of that faith story. So I've been formed in faith uh, by communities of faith. I've also been formed in faith by scholarly communities. Um, I went to Smith College in uh, Massachusetts and during my second year there, I took a class on Introduction to Old Testament. Uh, and fell in love with the Old Testament that semester. I had a wonderful uh, professor uh, named Joel Kaminsky, who uh, himself was uh, Jewish and opened my eyes to the world of Jewish interpretation, uh, which was a wonderful entry point to um, some of the depth and profundity uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, his encouragement, um, I said, you know, you might want to study this a little more. He said, well, you have to, if you want to really learn about the Old Testament, you have to know Hebrew. And I said, well, how would one do that? And uh, he happened to know oh, there's a summer program at Princeton Theological Seminary. So maybe you should go there and uh, learn Hebrew. And so he sent me to Princeton Seminary uh, one summer where I had a wonderful experience um, immersively learning uh, Hebrew. And then, of course, ended up back there to do a Master of Divinity. Uh, and that, too, uh, was a deeply formative experience uh, for me. Uh, in uh, being part of a community of rigorous scholarly study that was also deeply part of the life of faith. Uh, and I think this is innately true in the Presbyterian tradition that um, uh, rich scholarship is not in any way opposed to the life of faith, but actually is part of it. It's an expression of how we come to know who God is. Uh, Part of another wonderful learning community at Emory University, where I went on and did a PhD in Old Testament uh, and studied all about uh, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. That was my area of focus uh, there. And two in that community, um, not only learn from texts and traditions, but from the people who were uh, around me who um, were uh, studying in, in wonderful ways and uh, were, I was. Um, Wonderful to be part of a scholarly community that for my colleagues, uh, their scholarly work was very much motivated by a commitment to the life of faith, that all of these things were part and parcel together. Uh, and now, um, as um, Audrey said, I'm, I've been fortunate to be back at Princeton Theological Seminary. I've been serving in the administration there for about eight years and now serve as the executive vice president there. And so theological education is uh, my vocation. It is my day job, uh, but also very much part of my own um, personal commitment to, um, uh, to the life of faith and the life of scholarship and thinking about how these two come together uh, as part of how uh, we are all formed in faith as part of the family of faith. So I've been very fortunate that my uh, own faith and learning have been um, as deeply shaped, perhaps even more deeply shaped by the work that I get to do every day now uh, than even when I was a student at Princeton Seminary. So that has been a great joy. So uh, all day every day I get to think about these interesting questions of what is theological education? What does it mean? And as the world is changing so rapidly around us and the church is changing so rapidly around us, what does this continue to mean for theological education? Uh, so I want to go back in time a little bit, all the way back to Moses, uh, because of course theological education um, is, uh, is as old as the people of God. Right? Um, so let's begin with this uh, text from Deuteronomy. Uh, now this is the commandment, uh, this is from Deuteronomy 6, this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I have commanded you, so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. And here are these commandments then. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So here Moses is talking about uh, theological education, right? This is so essential uh, to the people of God. Uh, and why is that? Because it leads to flourishing life. Uh, in the land to which God has promised. Uh, and note the method for theological education that Moses uh, is talking about, uh, right? Keep these words, recite them, recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are away, when you lie down, when you rise. There's, some, there's a physicality to theological education. Find them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Right? So he's also pointing to the fact that theological education happens everywhere. Uh, it happens in families. It happens at home. Um, theological education is happening uh, right here, right now. I actually went to the wrong uh, location when I first pulled up today because there was a sign outside of the house next door that said, Sunday school this way. And so <laughs> uh, and Emily was there, and um, everything was ready for the children <coughs> to show up and come to uh, engage in theological education, which is what they are doing just right now, just so wonderful. Uh, so this is uh, an essential part of uh, the people of God. Uh, one more text uh, from 2 Timothy. So this uh, is Paul writing to his student, uh, Timothy. Again, another um, uh, artifact in the story of theological education. Listen to the advice that Paul gives. But as for you, as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry openly. What a beautiful proclamation of what theological education is. Right, uh, and this um, reminder, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it. Theological education is always passed down, right? It is deeply relational. It is about people. Uh, and the, the context, the core of theological education is scripture, right? This is how we come to know about God. Same thing Moses was saying in Deuteronomy. Um, that the law uh, leads to life. It is how we come to know who God is and God's will for us, how we are to live together. And the purpose of all of this um, is training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And why is that so important? Uh, because the times they may be changing. Right? Uh, so we may encounter, um, encounter difficulties in the world. And so theological education is a grounding to be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, 
so that we might convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Because there are lots of different kinds of teaching out there, Paul says, and some people might develop uh, itchy ears. I love this phrase. I think ears have ever been itchy. Um, and I think this is so true in the world we live in today, that uh, with uh, Google at our fingertips, uh, we have a whole host of teachers that are in our pockets on our phones uh, at any given time. Uh, and so theological education becomes even more important, right? So what is it that grounds us for the life of faith, the life that we share together, uh, and allows us to do the work of an evangelist to carry out the ministry fully, right? This becomes particularly important then, uh, to fast forward from Paul all the way to think about the reformers and the reformed tradition, uh, why theological education becomes particularly important. Uh, remember the call of the Re Reformation, um, sola scriptura, right? Back to scripture um, as the grounding uh, of our faith and life. Uh, and why is that? Because John Calvin, who is a favorite reformer for Presbyterians, uh, talked about scripture in this way, talked about the law in this way. Uh, Calvin was the one who talked about what he calls the third use of the law. So the law is, uh, why do we need the law? Because it shows us of our sin, right? And it uh, restrains us from doing things we shouldn't do. But he said the third and most important use of the law is actually connected to this. Uh, and it is to show us God's will, and it's actually what leads to life, right? So scripture is the source of life uh, that helps us to know God's will and to make our will more like God's will. Uh, and so that is why in the Reformed tradition, theological education has been so very important. Uh, and that was also a push for uh, sort of the, the democratization of theological education, uh, meaning that um, it was the conviction of reformers that theological education was for everyone, uh, not only for um, uh, people like me and Andre who go to seminary and study these things and are sort of uh, professional Christians, if you will, right? Um, <laughs> pastors and priests, um, but it is for the whole people of God. And, because, and that is because it is how we come to know God's will uh, more deeply. Uh, so I'm going to pause here for just a moment. I'm going to invite you to um, turn to the person next to you and just think about this question. I've shared a little bit with you about who taught me the faith. Who is it that taught you the faith? How have you come to know the faith? Uh, remembering what uh, Paul says to Timothy, um, continue what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. So just take uh, a minute or so with the person next to you how did you come to learn the faith? So is there a person that comes to mind, a community that comes to mind? Um, take a moment just to lift them up uh, in, in gratitude. Okay, uh, three minutes with the person next to you. That's right. We never 
different. My grandmother was, well, my mom and my grandmother were Spanish, so Roman Catholic. So I would always be taken to church all the time with my grandmother. I think you used the word drag, but it's okay. I was drag. I was a child, so I was like, okay. <laughs> so, but it really showed me the faith that she had, mm -hmm. because she probably won every day. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, it was embedded in me have that faith mm -hmm. in God, mm -hmm. but I didn't practice Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the modeling of the those modeling daily habits excellent. of behavior yeah, is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I remember when I was younger, there was a Catholic school in Chicago, Christian faith. Mm -hmm. 
That's a profound gift, isn't it? It um, is. And this, uh, this gift comes in, in so many ways by uh, being taken or dragged to church, as the case <laughs> uh, may be, or by uh, reading or by other um, models of um, how, how we ought to live, including in asking hard questions, including in probably not getting it right all of the time, but beginning again each day. Um, so I hope that uh, this question might give you something to reflect upon later and perhaps lift up a prayer of gratitude for those who have shaped you uh, in the faith uh, and to be cognizant of the ways that you um, and this community of faith continue to shape others in the faith. Uh, because faith is always something that is shared, it is passed on, um, and that exists within community, uh, as we've seen. Um, so this uh, brings us back to uh, thinking about another mode of theological education, which is what happens in seminaries. Uh, given how important theological education is to the people of God, uh, from Moses onward, and especially in the Reformed tradition, it's no wonder that we need seminaries. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about Princeton uh, Theological Seminary in particular. Uh, and uh, its part in uh, this story of theological education. Uh, so Princeton Seminary was founded in 1812, and it was uh, really an, an innovation in theological education because there were not seminaries um, at that time. And so uh, those who founded Princeton Seminary uh, really were experimenting uh, with, as they were crafting something new. Uh, ministers up until that time had really been uh, trained as part of the general curriculum in universities, uh, but the founders of Princeton Seminary uh, saw a particular need that they didn't think was being quite filled in the shaping of pastors, and so they had to ask a very interesting question, which is, um, what kind of school, what kind of seminary would form the kind of leader who would benefit the church and change the world? That was the question that they were reflecting upon back in 1812. Um, and so they had a couple of, because uh, they had a, you know, they were starting this from scratch. They could have gone about this any number of ways. Uh, but what they decided were a couple of things. Uh, first of all, they thought that pastors would be best trained for ministry in a context that valued serious academic study, rigorous academic study, and spiritual formation that these two things were tied together uh, as part of the curriculum, as part of the experience. Uh, so in the, uh, the founding documents of Princeton Seminary, where they sort of set out what they were up to, uh, they call this piety and strong learning. <laughs> piety and strong learning. This is what they thought they were up to. Uh, secondly, they wanted to create um, one national seminary not regional schools. So they, they thought about a couple of different models, right? Would it be better to have um, uh, schools that were located near uh, one particular, you know, different communities and people would come somewhere close to their region? They decided they didn't want to do that. They wanted to have one seminary where people would come from many different places all to join in one community because uh, this would be a place where different perspectives and backgrounds were represented. And they thought that this was very important to the kind of formation they wanted to happen there in this piety and strong learning. So they created one national seminary, not uh, regional schools. Uh, and thirdly, and perhaps most interesting, they believed that the seminary was in the public interest. They thought that leaders trained in this way would benefit not only the church, but the community at large. And of course, you think about what was going on in the world in 1812, uh, and they were sending out ministers into communities at a time when uh, the, um, many communities were, were being formed and the pastor of the congregation uh, was a prominent member of, um, in a citizen community. And so they had a very clear understanding that uh, what they were doing had implications for uh, the world broadly speaking. And so the founding documents, uh, they, they say this about what they thought they were doing. We are persuaded that an able and faithful ministry is one of the most distinguished blessings to the world. This seminary, then, even in its infant state, is an object of public interest, an object not only calculated to call forth the good wishes of our own church, but of the church at large, and even the nation. Though its origin be small, 
the voice of experience we trust will one day be heard to advantage from one extreme of these United States to the other. So uh, I think that is actually quite a bold vision when you think about the fact that in 1812, um, there was one professor and three students. <laughs> and they met in that professor's house. Uh, and yet, uh, there was a there was a worship service to inaugurate the launch of this seminary, and there was a beautiful prayer that's still part of the founding documents today um, that that prays for this vision that they had, and that they prayed that someday the graduates of this institution, uh, they said, might even span across the United States, maybe even across the world. <laughs> right? What an audacious claim! In 18. <laughs> Uh, and today, more than 200 years later, uh, there are more than 11,000 living alumni of Princeton Seminary who are engaged in ministry in every state uh, in the country and in more than 80 countries around the world. So their vision uh, has continued to bear uh, much fruit. And yes. is, is that the source of this, uh, this thought that Princeton is the theological center of the universe? <laughs> 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 Tom Sheffield used to say that all the time. I used to say that as well. <laughs> well, uh, I will defer to my colleague Tom Sheffield and his in so many ways. So, <laughs> yes. And so, Ann, uh, a, a question I have is: prior to the, the founding of the seminary, how did the people prepare to be ordained at, as a minister? I know in law, before there was law schools. And, and, you, and you read the law and, and kind of apprenticed under lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the same thing true uh, you know, for ministers? Yeah, so many different ways. Uh, an apprenticeship model was um, certainly uh, prominent, and you know, there are still many churches that operate by apprenticeship models today. Um, also, uh, through the regular, through, through the university system. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that was part of the regular uh, curriculum. So when you think about this is the origin of, um, you know, for example, Harvard Divinity School, Yale Divinity School. Um, you know, they've now formed uh, graduate schools within the institution, but originally that was part of the undergraduate curriculum that you know, ministers and lawyers and other professionals would be trained there. Um, Princeton Seminary, um, though was, um, the founders of Princeton Seminary were connected to Princeton University, has always been independent. And so um, this innovation in 1812 was forming a separate school and seminary for the specific purpose of training Christian ministers. Yes? Uh, do you think they disagreed with the way uh, students were being prepared to be ministers next door? I think part of what they were after was um, a, a, a focus on, again, rigorous academic study uh, and the spiritual formation. This piety piece was very important. Uh, so it's actually interesting when you uh, read the founding documents, they sort of, they set out uh, talking about daily habits and practices in the life of faith, that part of what they built into the curriculum at the beginning was uh, that on uh, Sundays there was to be actually no academic study, uh, but uh, gatherings for um, for prayer, for reflection, for scholar, for um, spiritual conversation, uh, and so they were thinking about how to how to weave that um, uh, into the experience, and also um, you know a, a depth of the scholarly study was also very important to them. And so again, this is now a graduate education, um, and so something that's coming on top of the, um, the undergraduate. Was there an intentional choice to be Presbyterian, if you know what I mean? Because some uh, theological seminaries are pretty much open and anyone can get trained, but from the beginning was it, you know, the John Knox uh, history? Yeah, so it was Presbyterian from the beginning, and again, this comes out of uh, such a strong commitment to scholarship in the Presbyterian and Reformed uh, tradition. So it was Presbyterian from the beginning, founded by Presbyterians. What I actually find very interesting about uh, uh, this year is, you know, you know, they say it's calculated to call forth the good wishes not only of our own church, that is the Presbyterian church, but of the church at large, even of the nation. So there was even an impulse at the very beginning that this was not only for Presbyterians, but that part of 
um, the, the, the gift and the commitment of this reformed tradition work more broadly. Um, which actually is very interesting when you think about uh, how we live out this mission today uh, as um, uh, the world is changing so rapidly, the Presbyterian Church is changing rapidly. It raised questions for the seminary about what does our Presbyterian identity mean when, like when I was a student there, about half of our students were Presbyterian. Um, now, given the changes in the Presbyterian Church, uh, about 20 to 25% of our students are Presbyterian. Um, so what does it mean to be Presbyterian? It doesn't necessarily mean that only Presbyterian students go there, but it means that what is, again, central to the Reformed tradition, what it means to be Presbyterian, is this thinking faith, faith-seeking understanding. And so the level of um, uh, uh, scholarly study connected as part and parcel to the life of faith, that is what it means to be Presbyterian and Reformed today, and how we think about living out this mission, not only for the Presbyterian Church, uh, but for the Church broadly, even for the world, right? Uh, so the, the other interesting thing when you think about the history of Princeton Seminary over these 200 years uh, is that it has had to shift and change over time in response to the world around it. So it started as this entrepreneurial enterprise, one professor, three students, uh, grew over time, uh, had to understand how do we um, how do we continue to accommodate this rigorous intellectual study and life of faith when the world is changing around us. So fast forward about a hundred years, I want to introduce you to my, my friend Charles Erdman, who was a professor of practical theology uh, at Princeton Seminary, appointed in 1906. Mm -hmm. um, so just about a hundred years after the founding. Uh, and Charles Erdman, when he was uh, appointed to this role of Professor of Practical Theology, uh, it was actually a very controversial appointment, uh, this creation of a chair in Practical Theology, meaning a study of, um, of, uh, of practical pastoral ministry, of preaching, of worship. Uh, this, this was a little controversial at the time, like how does this fit with the rigorous academic study of Greek and Hebrew and theology and the traditions? practical theology. Uh, and so Charles Erdman, uh, he gave an inaugural address when he was appointed um, as this professor, and he addressed uh, this head-on. And so this is uh, part of what he says. Why do we need this new chair to be sitting in? Uh, and Charles Erdman here. Uh, he says, some, so he's talking about the changes in the world uh, around the seminary. The multiplication of Bible schools and institutes, right? Schools popping up everywhere. The ignorance of the scriptures openly confessed by ministers. The increasing demand for the biblical instruction of lay workers. The revival of expository preaching. These and kindred signs of the times have convinced the trustees that for such a department, that is a practical theology, there is a place among the disciplines of the theological curriculum, and a place second in importance to none. He says, yet the trustees are confronted by an even more delicate and difficult problem. It is to so adjust this enlarged department to the seminary curriculum as to do no injustice to the other departments while meeting the imperious demand of the times. Right? What an interesting commentary. In 1906, uh, we have to found this new department of practical theology to meet the imperious demand of the times. <laughs> Uh, it's important to note that as controversial as this appointment was, this became one of the defining elements of the Princeton Seminary curriculum for the next hundred years. Uh, and that the development of practical theology, the um, field of preaching called homiletics, uh, the really, that, that scholarly discipline grew and developed at Princeton Seminary uh, and that had an outsized influence on, uh, on the theological academy uh, generally speaking. Uh, and so uh, it's a wonderfully interesting time to be at Princeton Seminary in 2023 because we are at another one of these inflection points, just like Charles Erdman was pointing to in 1906, uh, as we think about how does this um, theological education continue uh, to respond to the imperious demands of the times uh, in our own day and age. Uh, 
So I want to talk just briefly about um, three examples of things that we are thinking about a little bit differently as part of the theological curriculum uh, that are ways of trying to address these imperious demands of the time. Uh, so the first is called the farminary. Is anybody heard of farminary? So farm plus seminary is farminary. <laughs> uh, so the seminary uh, has a 21-acre farm, which is just down the road from our main campus, uh, and that has become an important location for theological education uh, in the conviction that uh, the skills and capacities of pastoral ministry uh, actually align very closely with the skills and capacities of one who tends the land, who tends the soil. Uh, who needs to understand uh, the seasons, who needs to know how to read the weather, the context, who needs to know how to grow things and plant things, to nurture things over time. Uh, and so uh, uh, classes that take place at the farminary have a combination of uh, classroom learning, much like you would expect out uh, of our regular classrooms, but also working in uh, on the land alongside one another. And it's become a wonderfully interesting location for theological education because you have a different kind of conversation uh, when you are working next to each other in the garden uh, and sharing a meal that has been uh, cooked from the produce of that garden uh, than when you are simply sitting in a classroom next to one another. Uh, so I uh, have to teach a class on wisdom literature. We were talking about the book of Job and I took the students out to the farminary and uh, we were reading one of the uh, magical texts of the book of Job, uh, which is talking about all of creation. And there was a different experience reading that text together, sitting next to the pond, hearing the birds overhead, actually being situated and rooted in creation. Uh, and so this has become a very uh, important uh, uh, expression of the seminary's mission. Many of our students come with um, a deep um, ecological sensibility and concern, and so this has been a really very popular program, so much so that this year we have just launched a new degree program, uh, a Master of Arts in Theology and Ecology, uh, which is rooted <coughs> in the farminary. Uh, so I'm gonna show you just a brief video uh, so you can actually see the farm. Over the course of our years here, I think the farm has been posing some challenging questions to us. What does it look like to have a relationship with the world that moves more towards restoration and renewal than extraction and exploitation? And, and what if the church was known for that? Those are the kinds of questions we want to wrestle with. What does it mean that we say that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth? There is new insight that emerges. It becomes, uh, like I said, three-dimensional. It becomes tangible. It becomes uh, multi-sensory. I think the graduates of this program could go in a thousand different directions in everything from the nonprofit sector to the corporate sector to churches to universities um, and colleges that uh, are looking for people with an ecological sensibility uh, in, in an effort to, to be attentive to those things. I love working with students in this space and working with other faculty and community members because I think it helped us be more human. So that's the farm. That's our farm in area. And good luck with produce. There's one simple hearing hack anyone can use to...
raised in the faith and in a farming tradition by his family uh, and uh, understood quite innately the um, interconnections between uh, um, uh, farming, thinking about sustainability, uh, thinking about um, agricultural life and uh, the nature of pastoral ministry. And so it started with an experiment. Hey, what, what would it look like to have one class out there uh, at the farm? Uh, which is a whole other story of how we came to have a farm in the first place. Uh, and now we have uh, courses in every academic department that are taught out there, um, multiple courses every semester, uh, and now have a, a fully fledged degree program that's located at the farm. So this is part of uh, how things how things grow uh, and develop. Uh, so the second example I want to talk about uh, is our program called Iron Sharpening Iron, uh, which is our executive education program for women clergy. Um, uh, so Iron Sharpening Iron comes from, um, I was the creator of this program, and so it all goes back to wisdom literature for me, and uh, Iron, um, from Proverbs 27, 17, uh, is the phrase, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Uh, and so that is the premise uh, of uh, this program of Iron Sharpening Iron, uh, which brings together uh, pastors, most of whom are about five to 10 years uh, into ministry, so they're coming back to the seminary, uh, having, having been serving in congregations uh, for uh, a combination of a curriculum that is uh, deeply engaged with thinking about uh, the best insights in leadership from a whole host of disciplines. So uh, our seminars range from um, thinking about strategic planning, change management, team development. Uh, actually, we have our uh, next seminar is coming up this week, and it is finance week at Iron Sharpening Iron, and so uh, is everything connected to budgeting, fundraising, grant writing, uh, facilities management, and capital project planning. Uh, and brings together this terrific uh, community of women pastors uh, to think about these issues together, and in conversation with leaders in a variety of different disciplines. Uh, so all of the um, teachers or presenters in our seminars are not pastors. Uh, they are from a variety of different disciplines, which positions the pastors at the table as the experts in the church uh, and the ecclesial uh, space. Uh, and so this has been uh, a wonderfully uh, enriching program uh, for us with a, just a terrific group of people. Um, I'll introduce you to one of our uh, graduates, this is Tiffany uh, Cheney, and Tiffany um, uh, graduated from our program about two years ago. She is the pastor of uh, Gathered by Grace, which is a worshiping community of young adults in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and Tiffany is a bivocational pastor, so she is also uh, a hospital administrator and serves as chief diversity officer of Baptist Health, which is a health system in Alabama that's one of the region's largest employers. Uh, and I think Tiffany's story is quite interesting because it also points to changes in, um, in ministry and in who and how people serve, right? So uh, she is a, a professional administrator and also working as a pastor. Uh, and at the end of the program, uh, she wrote this about our program. We have learned over the last two years, virtually and in person, so this is a hybrid program that brings people together on campus for uh, three times uh, for a week long at a time, and then they meet in um, uh, cohorts with a clergy coach uh, virtually in between. So she's gathered virtually and in person to learn together about strategic planning, volunteer management, conflict management, grant writing, change management, and more. Perhaps more importantly, we have built life-giving relationships. I chose to apply for this program because of the curriculum and its applicability to both to my role in ministry and in healthcare. And I'm most grateful for the people, particularly to my cohort of fellow pastors and our coach who have journeyed together and will continue to do so. So let's just set this as an example because it's another <laughs> artifact in the changing nature of theological education, uh, that the modalities by which we do this are a little bit different. Sometimes we need to be more flexible uh, to serve people in a variety of different ways. Uh, and also that it continues to be the networks of relationship, that community um, is how theological education is deeply rooted and formed. 
so last example uh, to this end, uh, Princeton Seminary this year is uh, starting a new program, which is our first hybrid program. Uh, so all throughout the history of Princeton Seminary, uh, the residential experience has been very important, continues to be very important, we think, for learning, uh, but also our adapting modalities so that people can engage with theological education uh, in, all different, in all different ways. Uh, and so this program has an emphasis um, on uh, justice and public life. It is designed for working professionals uh, so that uh, people can uh, bring their own expertise uh, to bear on the theological tradition. Uh, it is almost fully virtual, although people will come to our campus uh, in January for a week-long intensive uh, residential seminar, uh, but will uh, meet virtually otherwise. Um, I'm going to show just one more video uh, to hear from some of these students to give you a sense for what continues to motivate people to engage in theological education. Um, what is it that they are seeking? For about 15 years, I've been considering doing a master's degree related to theology. But as someone who was already working in full-time Christian ministry, I couldn't imagine how I could make that work uh, with my busy work schedule and with my family life. Princeton Theological Seminary, you have a winner here. This is a program that's innovative, it's insightful, it's well-designed for its own delivery across the platform for hybrid learning for working professionals. I chose this program because those three concepts and ideas and areas of focus, theology, justice, and the public life, are really at the core of who I am, what I value, and what I would articulate as my calling in stewardship of my life. It wasn't until I found out about this program that I felt God really calling me to start a new chapter in serving the community with my gifts and with my passions that God has instilled in me. What's been most rewarding just to engage with a cohort of um, really, really fascinating backgrounds, what they bring to um, sharing and reading of biblical texts, and um, how we all interact across the different discussion um, boards. So thank you for that. I also really appreciate that this program being remote enables me and my fellow students and classmates to remain rooted in our own communities and neighborhoods. Uh, the work of justice requires proximity, and so the opportunity to learn and be able to apply that in our daily lives without uprooting temporarily, moving states to a brand new community, and then returning uh, is something that we're really thankful for. I really believe that we can all be lifelong learners, and I'm excited to think about how much more there is to come. Uh, I really enjoyed the instruction of our professors. I loved the interactions with my cohort. I just give thanks to God for meeting this amazing group of people. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this program. I can't wait to discover more about myself, more about God, and more about the work that we can do and the difference that we can make. And I'm looking forward to learning all of that in this program. Okay, just to give you uh, a little sense of some of the voices of the students at Princeton Seminary today. Uh, what's interesting to me about that is um, this, uh, who our students are, why they are here, looks a little bit different than it did in 1812. And yet what you can hear about what brings them to this place uh, and why they value uh, this education is very consistent with that original vision of piety and strong learning uh, as central to what feeds um, the Christian faith and what uh, feeds their own sense of vocation uh, and commitment to to not just changing the church, but changing the world. So I uh, just want to end um, uh, with what's the future of theological education? We hear a lot about um, how things are changing so much in the world, things are changing in the church. Is there a future for theological education? Um, there's a professor at Emory Ted Smith who wrote this book by the provocative title, The End of Theological Education. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably
think his editor picked this. Uh, I don't think he thinks there's an end, and neither do I. Uh, but he, he closes with this, which I think is um, quite an important point. Theological education will continue because God longs to be known. God longs to be known because knowing and being known are part of love. A loving God will be known and will know us. That project of theological education conceived in the broadest sense of knowing and being known by God, that will continue. We have a God who wants to be known. Uh, and that is why theological education has always been and will always be important to the people of God. Uh, happening here in this uh, congregation community and here at Princeton Seminary. Uh, this congregation for a long time has been a very important part of uh, the ministry of Princeton Seminary, uh, the scholarship that this congregation has established in honor of Thomas uh, Much, the uh, Much Scholarship Endowment Fund, um, has supported more than 70 students over um, the years. It is uh, over 45 years old. It has um, continued to grow in value and continues to support our students. So um, the story of this congregation is part of the story of Princeton Seminary, is part of the story of these students that you met today uh, whom uh, this congregation continues to support. So um, thank you so much, as always, sure. for having me, and thank you for your support of um, theological education. We are so very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. You're making me want to just like do more degree programs. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so next week, speaking of Tom Sheffield, he will be here next week. So we will have him um, talking from a perspective of pastor emeritus and what our uh, faith stories are about. So, but thank you so much, Anne, for being here. We so appreciate it. Thank you, Craig and Mary, for hanging in there. And uh, we're going to be getting a better speaker soon, so hopefully we'll uh, have better But uh, Mary, I also record this on my phone, so I'll be posting it if you want to take another look later. <laughs> Oh good, good. Oh, she's. Oh my gosh, what a gift! Thank you for thank you for giving her to us. <laughs> good to see you, Craig. I'll see you soon. It's good to see both of you. Have a good day. Uh, and what about us making that? Yes. 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 Yes.